Hello, fellow bookworms. Welcome back to the Abyss Book Club. We're excited that you're back here joining us to talk about a new book. I'm Brittany. And I'm Hallie. And we're excited that you're joining us again. Thank you for tuning back in. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and check out our website for every episode. We have a post and it has a lot more information and pictures of things that we talk about. This month, we're covering the book The Chalk Man by CJ Tudor. To kick things off, we're going to start by talking about the author like we have in other episodes. And CJ Tudor is a pretty interesting woman. She is a female British author and she's married with a daughter. She was once a TV presenter, so she interviewed a bunch of famous celebrities like Robert Downey Jr., Emma Thompson, and Robin Williams. But interestingly, she also worked as a dog walker. She says that she's happy that she no longer has to chase dogs through muddy fields anymore because she's taken writing as a full-time job now. The Chalk Man was actually inspired by her daughter. One day, her daughter and some friends were outside playing and drawing with chalk on the sidewalk, and they had drawn a bunch of chalk people. And that night, she was doing some stuff around the house, and she saw outside a bunch of chalk people drawn on her driveway and got really scared and was like, wow, that's kind of creepy. So she decided to base a book on it. So the summary of Chalk Man is, in 1986, Eddie and his friends are on the verge of adolescence, spending their days biking in search of adventure. The Chalk Men are their secret code, stick figures they draw for one another as a hidden message. But one morning, the friends find a Chalk Man leading them to the woods. They follow the message only to find the dead body of a teenage girl. In 2016, Eddie is nursing a drinking problem and trying to forget his past, until one day he gets a letter containing a Chalk Man. The same one he and his friends saw when they found the body. Soon he learns that all his old friends received the note. When one of them is killed, Eddie realizes that saving himself means figuring out what happened all those years ago, but digging into the past proves more dangerous than he could have known. Because in this town, everyone has secrets, no one is innocent, and some will do anything to bury the truth. About murder. (laughs) Now we're going to talk about some of the things that were in the book, writing styles, the story itself that we thought were very interesting or things that stood out to us in our opinion. So be prepared for some spoiler alerts. Obviously, we always give spoiler alerts. So hopefully by the time you're listening to this, you've already read the book, but we definitely will in this one. And this book had some twists that you may not be prepared for. (laughs) The book had really beautiful imagery and metaphors a direct quote from the book that said, quote, if our world was a snow globe, it was the day some casual God came along, shook it hard and set it back down. Even when the foam and flakes had settled, things weren't the way they were before. Not exactly. They might have looked the same through the glass, but on the inside, everything was different, end quote. C.J. Tudor's book is filled with a lot of these really pretty metaphors or visuals for you to understand better what is happening in the story and for you to really understand what the characters may be feeling. So I feel like she did a very good job. There was also some clever foreshadowing in the book when Eddie says, quote, mine was taking stuff, collecting things, end quote. It actually means a couple different things. And that was at the very beginning of the book. So you didn't even know the situation with like the ring or the head or <laughs> any of the other <laughs> things like that. So you just think, oh, he's a kid like collecting things. And you don't really understand how dark it is until pretty much the very, very end. <laughs> yeah, that he's actually a kleptomaniac <laughs> for dead things. <laughs> Also, as you guys probably know from listening to Brittany and I talk about books, I am very fond of books that go from past to present, past to present, past to present, and kind of connect the timelines as you read the book. So I liked that the story kind of developed like that in The Chalk Man. I also think the concept of how the chalk figures were leading them through the woods to a dead body was really creepy, and that was a good visual that they were kind of following these childlike little drawings but to something super, super dark. Also, this book dealt with a lot of serious topics, political topics, and deep thoughts that were kind of intertwined in the story. And we selected three quotes from the book that we thought really represented some of those deep thoughts that she had. One of them was, quote, history itself is only ever a story told by the ones who survive it, end quote. Another one was, quote, we think we want answers, but what we really want are the right answers, human nature, We ask questions that we hope will give us the truth we want to hear. The problem is you can't choose your truth. Truth has a habit of simply being the truth. The only real choice you have is whether or not to believe it. End quote. And lastly was the quote, 
Sometimes forgetting was the kindness, remembering perhaps was the killer, end quote. So those really all delve into some really deep topics of like human nature and things that we want versus the things that are really there. One thing about the book that kind of made it a challenge for me to read was that I had a difficult time connecting to any of the characters. Usually when you read a book, there's at least one character you can really relate to. You want that person to succeed. You want them to find resolution and to have comfort in the end. And you relate to them on a personal level. But in this book, I had a really hard time relating to any of the characters. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I know one thing we talked about was how each chapter really left you hooked. Like there was a good cliffhanger at the end of most of the chapters. But sometimes that was why you continued reading instead of really wanting the whole story to unfold. You just like really needed to know that next event or whatever. So that's good for keeping the reader going and keeping them reading through. But sometimes that was more of the push to read the story than the story itself. And then a lot of the rest of the chapters were not super interesting or didn't have a lot going on. But that that end like cliffhanger was just there. (laughs) Yeah, and it didn't help that a lot of the events of the book didn't seem very jointed. It came across to Brittany and me that she had all of these really good ideas. She had a great scene with pointing to the dead body. She had a great method of communication between the boys, but somehow she had to connect all of this and add murder in. And it was like taking this park scene and the car accident and the fair, things that just didn't seem to really be contributing to the storyline but she still felt like she needed to add all of these things in. It just seemed very convoluted and not really structured properly. Yeah, some of the scenes were so detailed, so long, and really only contributed like a tiny little bit to the story. And it's like you could have just said that in a few sentences. Instead, you could feel that she had these scenes in her head and she was just trying to like put them down and then later come back and weave them together. But sometimes it didn't always work for me. Not to mention that a lot of the things seemed kind of irrelevant. The fact that we didn't know the girl's name for most of the book and then had a big reveal and it wasn't anybody who stood out to you as a significant character anyway. Yeah, you're like, okay, well, now we know. Yeah. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Yeah, there were just a lot of things that were introduced as something you may have held on to because it could have come up later or it might have been included in the twist or the storyline, but then it never did. I also, like you said, you didn't really relate to the characters. I found pretty much all the characters some degree of unlikable. So it was hard for me to jump in and really be like, oh, I hope this person finds resolution or whatever, because I just found them all really unlikable. And especially with the adult portion, like I just feel like that whole part of the story was pretty much a waste. I don't think that it really contributed much to go through again and again and again, hearing about how he's a drunk and how he's doing all this stuff like That just didn't add much to the story for me. And like you said, I think the chalk man aspect, the whole code thing was a really cool concept, but it sort of fell to the wayside a lot of the time. And I really feel like if she had just kept most of the story at the kid level and had them develop that code and have more events unfold when they're kids, I think it would have been better We saw one comment that said basically this book is a tweaked version of the book and movie It by Stephen King. I think where you have like the kids going on this, you know, journey to fight some evil and then later come in as adults and they all have their issues and there's a lot on that. I think the similarities are definitely there and it just didn't work in this context for me. Yeah, I agree. And I also feel like the twists in the books were very anticlimactic. Like when you found out that Mickey was actually the one causing all of the chalk stuff in the adult time because he wanted more information for a novel. It was just something that could have been built up and had a really big reveal, could have taken a crazy turn, but instead it kind of got downgraded in a sense. And it was the same thing with the priest being the killer in the end. There was a lot of hints towards it throughout the novel, and I felt like it wasn't as big of a surprise as it could have been. Like, I wasn't thrown completely off guard. Yeah, I I definitely saw a lot of the twists coming, and I know I read the book before you, and as you were reading, you were like, I think this is what happened, and I'd be like, oh, she got it. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so I know that you got it, too. I think the only twist that really threw me, but not in a good way, was the head thing. I just think that was there for shock factor and not anything else. It just made the character more unlikable to me, and like, ugh. I agree. 
And part of me really dives into that aspect of books. Like I love when books have gross, grotesque twists or things like that. I enjoy that. But the thing that unsettled me was that she could have thrived on that and she could have thrived on Eddie being a lot worse than he actually was and made him appear to be this guy who's trying to solve it but maybe he had been the one causing it and that could have been a huge twist in itself that maybe we didn't see coming and it would have shocked that he then took the head and that would have been a twist to add on to the shock factor but it was just like one quick shock done and still like slightly irrelevant in a way (laughs) yeah you're just like oh okay for, like first I thought he was a loser now I just think he's a weird loser like, <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah overall the book had a really good plot I just feel like the ending really could have made it or broke it for me and I think it's so interesting when you think about the fact that a lot of reviews and a lot of people absolutely adored this book I did appreciate it. I liked the book. It was interesting enough for me to read the entirety of it. But I just feel for me that there are ways that the story could have gone to make it better. Yeah, definitely agree. So next, we're going to talk about some of the true crime aspects that relate to this book. And the first one is preservation of body parts and taking tokens and things like that. So we know that Eddie took the head and... Um, he took the ring and there's a quote from the book, quote, it was still a little dirty with muck from the woods, but I didn't want to clean it. It wouldn't be hers anymore then. It wouldn't be special, end quote. The token was not just sort of to remember the event, but to be close to her and to feel still like a connection there instead of just something that jogs a memory. Even though Eddie himself was not the killer, his behavior of stealing stuff and taking body parts and things like that relate to a lot of killers. Which is why she could have made him a killer in the book. Yeah, it's like he had all the hallmarks of it. And then she was just like, no, he's just crazy. (laughs) He's just the weirdo. John Douglas, who you might know from Mindhunter, said, quote, Killers like to take trophies and souvenirs from their victims, keeping some memento, a lock of hair, jewelry, newspaper clippings of the crime. It helps prolong, even nourish their fantasies of the crime, end quote. So that's a pretty common thing for killers and in this case just someone sort of adjacent to the crime that had some morbid fascination or obsession with that kind of thing. One example that is pretty popular of this but I actually didn't know all the ins and outs of it. I think sometimes like we've talked about before you hear all these names of these serial killers but sometimes you don't really know every single in and out of them and I did not know that Ted Bundy actually kept the heads of some of his victims. He would keep them as kind of trophies, but he would also clean their hair, apply makeup to them, and and partake in necrophilia. And we know he would return to bodies and perform acts on them. So he definitely really fell into that keeping trophies and keeping the, this connection to the crimes that he committed instead of just, like we said, a trophy like you'd put on a shelf and just like remember an event. He really wanted to participate and keep it close to the crime that he committed so he could relive it in full basically another dominating theme in the book is notes and codes we've seen this a lot through true crime where criminals like to tease victims or the police with notes and codes to kind of throw them off course or give them hints in some type of way one widely known example is the zodiac killer He taunted the public and law enforcement with codes, even including ciphers occasionally. Many of the codes are still unknown and undeciphered today, after 50 years of no resolution. The Zodiac Killer is known to have killed about five people, but it's suggested that he killed upwards of 30. And there was one code that they got called Z340, and it's been especially troubling to crack but they believe that it contains information on the serial killer's identity. So it's been pursued and pursued by professional cryptographers and it still hasn't been cracked. So that's something that they continuously pursue. Another probably lesser known case is about a man named Paul Rubin. He was 18 years old, an Orthodox Jew, and lived in Brooklyn, as well as attending NYU as a chemistry student. In 1953, Paul Rubin was found dead in a ditch near the Philadelphia airport. 
He had enough cyanide in his system to kill 10 men. And in his possession was a fountain pen gun, a picture of a Nazi aircraft that was surrounded by U.S. soldiers, and a 38 caliber cartridge shell. He was wearing unusually thick glasses that were compared to magnifying glasses, and he had a typewritten cipher that was taped to his belly. Even though they couldn't decipher the writing, in regular handwriting was the words Dulles and Conant. This is interesting because at the time, a man named John Foster Dulles was to be the new Secretary of State, and another man named Dr. James B. Conant was at the time, the president of Harvard University, but he was becoming America's first high commissioner in West Germany. So it was believed that maybe this was some terrorist attack or group that was going against the government. Maybe this was a political espionage. But so far, there's been no further details on if the cipher has been cracked. We also wanted to talk about people being charged after self-defense or defense of others. In the book, there's a quote Despite the fact that she saved three lives, Nikki could still be prosecuted for the manslaughter of her father, end quote. This brings up a lot of issues because different states have different policies, different countries have different policies. So depending on where you are, this may fall under the right of self-defense or defending others. But we had um, two examples that kind of showed both sides of it. One is in Detroit, this young boy was trying to sell some video games online And he decided to meet with someone in front of his dad's house to sell these video games. But when the buyer showed up, he actually intended to rob this boy and he ended up shooting him. And his father kind of saw all this happening in his front yard and came out and shot and killed the man who shot his son, which seems pretty cut and dry that he was defending his son and his son had already been injured. But the police decided to take him into custody And they even requested a warrant and sought to charge him with four firearms felonies. Michigan does have stand your ground laws, which means that you can defend yourself. But things in Detroit can be a little shaky. Most people in that situation would get off, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. I don't have a final update for this case as to whether he was ultimately convicted or even charged or if they just decided to dismiss the whole thing. But that's one situation where they definitely treated him like a criminal in the beginning, at least. And kind of on the other side of that spectrum in Texas, a man kidnapped a five-year-old girl and took her into the woods to sexually assault her. And her father actually came upon them in the woods after a neighbor had told him that this man was dragging this little girl into the woods. And he actually beat the attacker to death with his bare hands. (laughs) He then called 911 and he was like, I don't know what to do. I think he's dying and all of this. And the man did end up dying, but the father was charged with absolutely nothing. They were like, good job. (laughs) So those are kind of two extremes of the spectrum where it's like on one end, they treat him like a criminal and charge him with a bunch of stuff. On the other end, they're just sort of like, way to go. It's kind of scary that it can go either way because you want to feel safe in defending yourself and defending people, especially if their lives are in imminent danger, like in the book. So that seems pretty straightforward, but you never know. Another true crime perspective that we got from the book was about teacher predators. Obviously, Mr. Halloran was having relationships with one of his students. And even though it's brushed off in the book as being somewhat normal in the eyes of Eddie and his peers as an adult, it's seen as him being a predator to a young girl. In 2018, an article was posted by the Dallas Morning News that talked about the relationship between teachers and students and the statistics. And they saw an increased number of cases where teachers were having inappropriate relationships with students. They believe this is due to a law that came out stating that any principals, superintendents, or fellow teachers that were aware of the problem and didn't take the liberty of reporting it were also subject to criminal charges. The Texas Education Agency said that between 2017 and 2018 that they saw 429 cases of student-to-teacher inappropriate relationships. That is an insane number just from Texas alone. Literally makes me never want to send my kids to school. Especially in Texas. (laughs) And one female was even said 
to be having sexual relationships with a ninth grader. Something that I thought was kind of laughable is that in Texas, when the teachers who are sexual predators resign from their job and move to another area where they might be able to get a job, even though they still are being predators, the legal system calls it, quote unquote, passing the trash. (laughs) Another case that we found was based in Wisconsin in September 2019, so roughly seven months ago, about a woman named Courtney Rosnowski, who was 31. She was a teacher at one of the schools and was accused of sexually assaulting three students by school staff and charged with two counts of showing her private parts to students. She was having a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old boy. The boy said to the detectives, quote, well, it is every kid's dream to do a teacher, end quote. He also said that Courtney had told him, quote, he was special and deserved special things, end quote. That is very stereotypical of predators. It's a grooming technique. And clearly she was manipulating someone who appeared to be easily influenced. Their relationship had been going on for about a half a year, and they even had sex at the boys' home once. So teachers being predators is sadly very common. It doesn't matter the gender at all or the age, clearly. I mean, you had a teacher preying on a ninth grader, and then you also have a woman preying on a boy student. It's not gender exclusive. So going off of that, sexual assault and child abuse were themes in this book. As far as child abuse, the quote, Nikki always had bruises. I don't remember ever seeing her without a brown or purple mark somewhere. Once she even had a black eye, end quote. She suffered a lot of abuse as a child and it was constant enough that other people noticed, but no one really did anything about it, which I think is sadly pretty common. According to the National Children's Alliance, quote, about four out of five abusers are the victim's parents. A parent of the child was the perpetrator in 78.1% of substantiated cases of child maltreatment, end quote. Sadly, a lot of kids go through that, and it's a very common and pervasive problem. As far as sexual assault, we've talked about that in several episodes, and we wanted to kind of offer a different perspective on it with this case. So we wanted to talk more about male-male sexual assault. And one example we found were allegations of sexual assault within the Boy Scouts. In 2019, a group of attorneys received 428 accusations of rape, abuse, and molestation against Boy Scout leaders. Time posted an article at one point that said, quote, because the Boy Scouts of America are federally chartered nonprofit, they must provide annual reports to Congress. And attorneys for the former Scouts say the organization has not included information about abuse accusations in those reports. One of the attorneys, Tim Kostnoff, said, quote, they were kicking out child molesters at a rate of one every two days for 100 years, end quote. They also stated that a child abuse expert analyzed their files and found 12,254 boys had reported experiencing sexual abuse at the hands of at least 7,800 suspected assailants between 1944 and 2016. Men who have come forward identified 300 more men responsible that were not noted in those files. And a lot of these people are influential community members. They're, you know, fathers and uncles and teachers and all kinds of people that you would just not suspect. But sadly, it's not just Boy Scouts. It's pretty much every organization. It's public school. It's a lot of churches. So that kind of thing just happens way too often. In these national and international organizations, it's pretty common for people to just sort of be moved around. And so if you have an accusation in one place, they just sort of move you to another. I know that happens in the Catholic Church quite a bit. So it's a pretty common tactic of organizations that are just trying to cover up these things and put image over the lives and well-beings of children. Yeah, it's a sad thing that you read about and all we can do is just fight the system and spread the word and raise awareness. Watch your kids, talk to your kids. Don't ever let them out of your sight. (laughs) (laughs) Helicopter mom. (laughs) And that kind of concludes our discussion for the Chalk Man. We really hope you guys liked it. And we really want to hear what you have to say about this book. 
clearly there was some controversy on people who liked it versus people who didn't and the reasonings behind everything. So if you have any thoughts, please join our Abyss group page on Facebook. We'll make a thread that talks about opinions for the book. So you just comment down below and we can all have a good discussion. So our book for June is going to be The Woman in Cabin 10 by Ruth Ware. We are very excited to talk about this book. I know that we say that every (laughs) month, but we just get really excited. To give a little sneak peek of the book, if you haven't heard about it, we are going to read the summary for you. Quote, in this tightly wound, enthralling story reminiscent of Agatha Christie's work, Lo Blacklock, a journalist who writes for a travel magazine, has just been given the assignment of a lifetime, a week on a luxury cruise with only a handful of cabins. The sky is clear, the water's calm, and the veneered select guests, jovial as the exclusive cruise ship the Aurora, begins her voyage in the picturesque North Sea. At first, Lowe's stay is nothing but pleasant. The cabins are plush, the dinner parties are sparkling, and the guests are elegant. But as the week wears on, frigid winds whip the deck, gray skies fall, and Lowe witnesses what she can only describe as a dark and terrifying nightmare, a woman being thrown overboard. The problem? All passengers remain accounted for, and so the ship sails on as if nothing has happened, despite Lowe's desperate attempts to convey that something, or someone, has gone terribly, terribly wrong, end quote. Brittany read this book a while back and she was really fond of it. So we are super excited to read this with you guys and to be able to talk about this whodunit mystery. Let us know if you have any suggestions, any thoughts, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for jumping into the abyss with us. Bye.